everyone and welcome to ESRI's and the American Planning Association's webinar, Funding Planning and Economic Initiative, Economic Development Initiatives through ARPA. A couple housekeeping items before we get started. If you have any questions during the webinar, um, please make sure to put them into the question and chat function and we'll do our best to answer those questions that you might have at the end of the presentation. At the end of this webinar, you'll also be prompted to complete a survey. Um, please complete the survey so that we can know how best to follow up with you after the presentation. And without further ado, I'll get, go ahead and introduce our um, presenters for today's webinar. So our first presenter is, you'll, have, you'll hear from is Jason Jordan. Um, Jason is APA's Public Affairs Director and is responsible for strategic outreach to decision makers and influencers who interact with the planning profession. He leads government affairs, policy, and advocacy efforts of the association. This includes development of APA policy guides, representation of APA with congressional offices, federal agencies, and partner organizations. The last presenter you'll hear from is Keith Cook. Keith is the Global Industry Manager for Planning and Community Development at ESRI. He has been a GIS professional since 1994 and has worked for planning and community development agencies at the regional and municipal level. And with, without further ado, we'll have Jason go ahead and kick us off. Great, thank you so much, Natalie. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you today and thanks to everyone for joining us. Thanks to Esri for partnering with APA on this webinar and, and many other things. Uh, it's, a, it's a great partnership and, and we're happy as always to, to work together. Um, lots to cover today, um, so I'm gonna jump right in. Um, you know, this this presentation is really built around the American Rescue Plan Act, um, ARPA, as it's sometimes referred to. Um, but with events happening rapidly, um, we felt it was important to talk about a couple of the other kind of main threads of public policy here in Washington that affect planning, affect local government uh, in particular. Uh, and that's the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Uh, as well as the Build Back Better Act, which is sometimes um, uh, referred to because of the mechanism by which it's being adopted as the reconciliation package. So we've really got these three tracks of major, really landmark pieces of legislation that have been moving over the course of the last uh, 11 months or so, and all have major implications. And, and one of the reasons why I sort of expanded the purview of the conversation beyond just the Rescue Plan Act is that for the professionals who are in communities looking at moving forward with planning or capital projects and want to layer in federal funding as part of that effort, um, you will see that in many ways, um, these things will work together potentially in how you uh, practically uh, advance those and, and use the different resources that are available uh, through each one uh, of these pieces of legislation. So I'm gonna sort of take it one by one, but before I do, let me just give you a, a general sense of the status. I'm, I'm sure you're aware um, ARPA was enacted uh, back in the spring. This was the major recovery legislation, the first major uh, action of the new Congress and the new administration uh, builds on uh, work that had been done in the prior year, um, earlier on in the pandemic, the CARES Act, uh, that provided similar kinds of assistance, although the two differ in important ways, which I'll get to in just a minute. Um, total package there, just under $2 trillion, $1.9 trillion in overall funding, covering a lot of bases. I mean, when you look at the, the broad scope of ARPA, um, you see that it touches almost every corner of, of the federal government. Um, more recently, of course, and after a lot of uh, uh, machinations and, and debate, the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, was was enacted just a few weeks ago. Uh, it's a $1.2 trillion package, um, obviously, as the name implies, focused on infrastructure. Important to keep in mind here that while it's often referred to as just the infrastructure bill for uh, transportation professionals in particular, it, it's useful to sort of differentiate the 
the fact that it's really two bills in one. Um, it's a full five-year reauthorization of the full suite of federal surface transportation programs. And then layered on top of that uh, is supplemental spending in a variety of infrastructure categories, most of which are transportation, but it also touches other areas, uh, water, uh, broadband, for instance, and, and we'll talk more about that. And then lastly, you know, we're in the situation where um, we're waiting to see what happens with the Build Back Better Act, the reconciliation package. It's still pending. Uh, a version of it has cleared the House of Representatives. Um, the hope um, that has been articulated by the leadership in the Senate is that they will be able to move that package um, sometime before the end of the year. Um, ideally, um, move it all the way through the process into the president's desk, but chances are it's going to be amended and would have to go back to the House. So we're, we're still waiting to see exactly what the timeline there is. Um, it's a $2.2 trillion package. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the very narrow planning specific pieces um, that are in that package, but much like the uh, ARPA, it covers a very broad scope of social domestic programs in addition to some of the planning, transportation, housing, community development specific items. So lots going on with um, major impacts really. Um, so uh, I, I mentioned before that ARPA is sort of the successor legislation to the CARES Act, which is really the first piece of recovery focused legislation, major recovery focused legislation that came out relatively early on in the pandemic. Um, and I think it's fair to say we learned a lot about what worked and what didn't work as well in the CARES Act, particularly as it applies to the needs and responsibilities of local government and planners in, in driving recovery forward, frankly. Um, and so when, when ARPA was being developed, there was a lot of conversation in that debate about the fact that the CARES Act was really narrowly defined in some respects. That is um, the direct allocation of relief funding to local governments really only applied to larger municipalities and funneled a lot more of the funding either through existing federal programs or through the states. So smaller communities had a more difficult time directly accessing the funds. The, the other issue is the flexibility of those funds. Um, the Treasury Department was responsible, well, is responsible really in both pieces of legislation, but uh, the initial uh, guidance and regulations around CARES Act funding for local government that came out of the Treasury Department had a, a definition associated with it as very narrowly tailored to um, ensuring that if you used CARES Act money, it, the nexus to the actual pandemic and pandemic related expenses had to be very close. So it was much easier to use CARES Act money for uh, public health associated costs than it was to cover, cover other kinds of government activities that had suffered because of the drain of resources into public uh, public health emergency. So we knew going into the crafting of ARPA that there needed to be some attention paid to providing broader flexibility if we really wanted to pivot this from being a narrowly tailored approach to the specific circumstances of COVID to a broader platform for generating, uh, you know, broad range economic recovery. Um, in, in terms of how the bill goes about doing that, and I'm speaking specifically about the elements of the bill that relate to local government that um, are planning and, and develop, uh, economic development specific here, what we see are a blend of grants and formula programs. So in, in some cases, um, you know, you've just got an open eligibility based on the size of community you're in. So you'll see in a forthcoming slide here that if you're a CDBG entitlement community, there's just a set allocation of funding that, that, that goes to you. Um, in other instances, and an example would be some of the economic development programs, there's sort of specific program silos that have to be applied to in order to access the funding. So it's, it's a bit of a blend. But, you know, the really good news is that it's incredibly flexible in terms of, uh, you know, these are these are grants, not loans. Uh, the, the timeline associated with it is very flexible. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit um, a, a, about that, um, uh, that whole process uh, here in just a second. What you can see here uh, on this slide is the sort of top line summary really of how the state and local fiscal recovery dollars are, are allocated out in the legislation. 
Um, this actually was a big point of debate when the bill was being crafted about whether or not uh, there needed to be a separate fund specifically for uh, state and local governments. Um, the, an argument was made that the CARES Act had been sufficient in that uh, the sales tax revenues were recovering quickly enough that this wasn't necessary and that it should focus more on, on other aspects of, of recovery as opposed to, to fund uh, state and localities directly. Um, we thought at APA that was incredibly important. We partnered closely with um, our municipal government allies to make the case for in, incorporating these funds that are aimed directly at, at states and localities. What you can see here, uh, the states get um, a, a population proportional pot of funding. Uh, and then on the local side, there's sort of this, this split that you see um, between cities and counties um, so that um, both ultimately receive 60, $65.1 billion population adjusted um, with an allocation directly to counties and this allocation to cities with a split between the funding that goes directly to CDBG um, community development block grant entitlement communities versus those smaller communities who don't qualify um, for that particular threshold, but um, are nevertheless directly in, in, entitled to funding that, that flows uh, through the states to them. Um, there are a couple of separate accounts there as well, much smaller, um, a $10 billion account for coronavirus capital projects, and then a separate set aside for uh, for tribal governments, although there's some tribal eligibility built into some other funds. So the total amount going to tribal governments is larger than that amount, but that's what comprises this um, this specific set of, of funds for state and, and local governments. Um, it, I, I, I talked a little bit earlier about some of the changes in ARPA as it relates to the CARES Act and some of the additional flexibilities I just wanted to, you know, call some of those things out specifically here. And, and I will say that, you know, there's a lot of detail that's available in terms of um, uh, the specifics around some of these eligible use areas and, and restrictions and so forth that I'm just not going to have time to get into today. We can take some of those in questions perhaps, but just want to give you an overview of kind of how these, these local funds um, are structured. Um, first of all, you've got four broad use categories here. So when you think about how are we going to be able to take the dollars that are available to our community, you know, by right, so to speak, what are the sort of uses? You can see here, very broad. So the traditional category that we saw a lot of in the CARES Act is public health response. So this covers a variety of contact tracing activities or other sorts of health engagements could be directly tied to the pandemic or, or sort of broader health issues that have emerged as a need as, as we've gone through um, the last year and a half plus. Um, but the big categories from our perspective that really add significant flexibility to the overall funding relate to these next two bullets here in terms of negative economic impact, um, which is largely focused on specific communities or specific populations that have had uh, major dislocations or major negative impacts um, as a result of the pandemic. So there's application here um, to support emergency housing, um, for instance. Um, there's eligibility for a whole range of capital infrastructure and other kinds of community development activities um, aimed at communities that collectively um, you know, have suffered disproportionately, for instance. The other really broad category here, and, and one that has made this incredibly useful, uh, is this definition of government revenue loss. So basically, um, there's a formula in here where local governments can make the case that um, as they've lost revenue due to the pandemic um, and their budgets have, have had to shift to accommodate that, that they can apply ARPA funds um, for pretty much any, um, I shouldn't say any, there are restrictions, but many uses um, based on the fact that there's been uh, a revenue loss associated with it. So this is actually how um, a, a lot of backfilling of projects that were put on hold uh, and planning that had been put on hold during the pandemic uh, have important eligibilities to move forward. Last category relates to some additional uh, compensation for uh, folks deemed essential workers uh, paid by local governments, firefighters and medical technicians and things of that nature. Uh, in terms of timing, this is really important. Um, CARES Act had a really narrow timeline where the funds had to be moved out very quickly, spent very quickly or, or, or returned. 
the timeline on ARPA is much longer. Uh, and again, this is part of the whole overall philosophy about this being a, a broad base for recovery. So um, funds can be obligated, meaning designed and contracted all the way through the end of 2024 with the actual expenditure uh, needing to happen by the end of 2026. So a pretty decent runway here for doing some planning, for thinking through things in advance, and, and getting those those funds you know out the door, but not necessarily having to do it in a constricted timeline where you're pretty much uh, locked into only having to do projects that are already on the drawing board. Um, on the local match, this is the amount of money that locals would have to put in in order to access some of the funds. Um, pretty broad here. Uh, it just has to be specifically authorized um, in another program. So you will see when we talk about the infrastructure bill that there's some programs there that actually allow you to use ARPA funds, federal ARPA funds, as the local match for unlocking of uh, you know, other kinds of transportation related assistance. And this becomes important when we get down to this issue of infrastructure eligibility, because um, the way this uh, legislation was structured, there are some restrictions here. Um, it calls out specifically water, sewer, and broadband as eligible infrastructure uses, um, but it wasn't intended to be a traditional infrastructure bill, you know, bridges and highways and transit programs um, in terms of capital construction. Um, although it does provide for this flexibility due to revenue loss. However, there's pending legislation that's actually already um, unanimously passed the Senate that would create even more flexibility in these accounts by allowing them to use um, ARPA funds on anything that's eligible under the transportation um, program or CDBG and a, a few other accounts. So basically it would free up whatever um, restrictions are remaining would be removed to apply this um, directly to infrastructure. The, the the main restrictions here are you're not supposed to use it for so-called rainy day funds, padding the budget, um, or for debt service, and there are some restrictions on using it for pension contributions, which when you think about it from the perspective, the sort of selfish perspective of folks who are looking to move this into planning and community development, economic development activities, is a positive thing because it sort of keeps this funding focused on uh, activities that the government wants to pursue as, as opposed to some of the sort of um, important but secondary from our perspective in terms of the financial stability um, issues. So it really does keep ARPA deployed in the places where we think it can have the most meaningful impact. Beyond that pot of money that's specifically aimed at state and local governments that has the broad flexibilities, there's a whole laundry list of uh, other sorts of program funds that are available through ARPA. Um, I'll talk in a second more specifically about the economic development side, but there's $3 billion there um, to fund EDA related programs um, that, that many of which have very broad planning eligibilities um, contained in here. You can see the range here of housing related assistance. Um, this incorporates uh, everything from the emergency rental aid, which was designed to help people who were uh, at risk of uh, being evicted, uh, the homelessness program, of course, uh, uh, tenant rental assistance involved uh, in, in this package. So lots of different uh, housing related uh, support systems in the, in the legislation. There was also a transportation element um, with 30 plus billion dollars for public transportation. Importantly, this set of funds includes operation maintenance and payroll costs. So we're not talking about uh, necessarily uh, capital dollars, which traditionally the, the federal transit program focuses on capital investment uh, as opposed to operations and maintenance. So this is more flexible funding for transit agencies, recognizing the unique stresses that those, those agencies um, have suffered over the last couple of years. And then an additional um, set of resources aimed at airports and, and at Amtrak, again, trying to counter some of the specific impacts of the changes in, in travel demand um, as a result of the pandemic. So you can see here, um, you know, lots of different resources that can be applied together, right? So if you're if you're tapping into a homelessness assistance program funds for work that you're doing there, that can be also leveraged with some of the uh, additional flexibility in the funds that may be going to you as a county or or as a city um, to accomplish you know one large project or to layer in things like planning on on top of kind of the programmatic assistance um, that you see through more of of these accounts. I'll talk more about those strategies for how you how you actually accomplish that in a second. Um, 
I, I, I'll, I'll just touch briefly on some of these e economic development programs. This is not a huge portion of the overall package when you're talking about nearly $2 trillion, um, but $3 billion into EDA is a significant investment. And I, I called this out specifically because I wanted you to get a sense of how EDA has chosen to sort of track the $3 billion that they have available into sub accounts, each of which has its own, its own set of timelines and its own set of eligibilities. Um, some of them uh, you know, require applications, some of them have rolling applications, some of them have deadlines. So you know, when you're thinking about how you use these, it's important to, to look specifically at where your project might land or where your planning might land in, in, in terms of some of these, these categories. I'll mention specifically the economic adjustment assistance um, category because it's the broadest in terms of its application into, into planning and, and regional and community development activities generally. It has very broad application, very broad eligibilities. It has rolling application um, there. Uh, the other one that uh, is is perhaps of, of particular note is the statewide planning um, research and networks. I'll, I'll lift that up because A, it's planning specific. But B, it's indicative of how the Biden administration is going about structuring um, some of the dollars that have to be applied for because they've layered on top of this category and some others, um, not hard criteria, but some, we'll call them screens for things like uh, uh, tackling social equity challenges or uh, incorporating climate change considerations. So some of the other priorities that the administration has in terms of their vision of, of the, the, the president's broad Build Back Better agenda reflected in you know, how you might, might frame some of, your, uh, some of your applications for some of these specific dollars. And this is one where EDA um, called out those, those issues uh, real specifically. Um, so some, some broad observations here on how do you begin to take this alphabet soup of programming, uh, nearly $2 trillion of funds, and actually think about uh, you know, the, the projects and the needs and the potential impacts in your community. Well, the first thing I would say is, is now's the time. Um, you may never work in an environment where there's this level of federal funding available with so few restrictions aimed directly at uh, planning, economic, community development kinds of activities. Um, so without putting too fine a point on it, money is really not our issue right now. Um, so this is a time to be ambitious and to move forward um, and, and to really think about planning as, as uh, a, a way to jumpstart, uh, we call it at APA, you know, recovery and reinvention. So moving toward that reinvention idea by investing right now and, and planning because you've got a little bit of that runway. A couple of other important things here. Because of the, the structure of the bill provides money to states, counties, and local governments, there's an opportunity for places where there's good coordination and the possibility of collaboration to leverage those funding streams together. So conversations at regional and state scale are, are potentially really valuable as you think about coordination of investments by those different players. Um, the availability of project dollars, right? Um, through all of the different silos that I that I mentioned here, actually frees up a lot of the local relief funding for planning and for some of the um, design to ensure that we're actually funding the right kinds of projects, which has been a problem with stimulus packages in the past that focus more on quick turnaround and shovel ready projects. This gives us a little bit more um, space to, to focus on planning. And you'll see in the infrastructure discussion, that's that idea has expanded even further. I mentioned the, the focus on you know, economic impacts, equity, moving from a recovery to reinvention. A, a lot of those screens are in place here. Uh, and I would say that you know, as you're thinking about how, to, how do you go beyond just ARPA and think about ARPA in context of other things, you know, looking at the infrastructure bill, looking at traditional uh, federal appropriation programs that you may have experience with, really gives the, the chance to, to look for different options for how you fill those gaps and, and blended match options when you're looking to, uh, to deal with that issue if, you, if there's a, a local match required for some of these programs. Um, so uh, let me shift quickly now to, um, to, to the infrastructure legislation. A um, lot to be said here. 
and certainly not enough time to go into detail, but I did want to hit some highlights. Uh, I mentioned before, we're talking about a, a five-year reauthorization that contains a whole laundry list of specific reforms. So if you're familiar with how the a transportation alternatives program worked before, this bill doesn't just provide more money for biking and walking programs, it actually changes a lot of the structure of those programs through the reauthorization, and then adds some additional funding on top of that uh, in individual categories. There's also an important shift here um, toward more discretionary grant programs, which gives a lot more purview to USDOT in crafting eligible uses and priority uh, criteria around these programs. So the formula programs are still there. Those pipelines still exist. They're still funded. Um, but it really adds on top of that formula base this new um, sort of buffet, if you will, of discretionary grant programs. Um, there are also a couple of new important formula programs, particularly uh, in areas related to climate change and resiliency. So you, in those categories, you will see new formula funding uh, coming to uh, states and MPOs, uh, as well as uh, these competitive programs. Uh, often those competitive grant programs have eligibilities that allow local governments to compete directly for the dollars. One of the things that was important to us uh, is as part of the reform process was to have planning set aside as a, as a use as part of these programs so that when we think about the climate title or the resilience title of the, of the bill, that there's some, some specific eligibilities for planning so that that piece isn't ignored in the rush to move toward major capital projects. Um, that's particularly true in this legislation as it relates to some things like safety and equity, and, and I'll touch on those more in just a second. Um, there's more sub allocation, so more local and regional authority to actually get the dollars and spend them directly. Um, there's also a, a, a focus on trying to link housing and infrastructure, which connects to what I want to say about the reconciliation bill in, in just a second. But that's another through line in all three of these bills, the idea of, of trying to do what planners always want to do, which is encourage more integration of land use, housing and, and infrastructure. And that's one of the areas where I think the Esri tools that Keith's going to talk about can really be helpful to us. Um, broadband uh, is a major emphasis of the bill and certainly an area of great need that's been highlighted by, by the pandemic. And then there's some important stuff for, for folks who work in MPOs around some pilot programs that focus on, on mapping and models, uh, accessibility, and really changing how we use data and technology tools to drive uh, not just the planning process, but actually the prioritization of projects uh, as part of planning, um, which we're pretty excited about. Um, I, I mentioned that we've got formula programs and we've got grant programs that are contained in the reauthorization component of the infrastructure bill. You can see them listed there. Um, the formula programs are the same traditional categories with, with these two new elements, um, one focused on carbon reduction as part of climate change um, uh, measures, and then the new PROTECT program, which is a resiliency program aimed at um, uh, creating greater resiliency in, in transportation uh, networks and infrastructure more generally. And then you can see that list of the grant programs, and the ones that are bolded there at the top are all brand new individual discretionary grant programs. So when we think about the path forward, I would love to tell you more specifically uh, when it's gonna be available and what the rules are going to be and how you apply. We're going to see rulemaking and guidance uh, issuance in all of these categories as USDOT begins the process of turning this bill into an actual functioning program. So you can see there's quite a lot of work to be done to shape how these programs are ultimately going to operate. And, and I can say for APA's perspective, um, we're gonna be very focused on trying to ensure the best possible rules and guidance around these programs that promote good planning and the interests of local communities. And I would say it's something very much to keep your eye on um, as, as those things will really guide um, and dictate to some extent, ultimately, what the real impact of the programs would be. But I will say what, what, what I see here is that there's a platform for pretty significant reform, but it pushed a little bit of the burden of that reform on individual regions, communities, and states to put forward good projects and good plans. There's been some criticism of the bill that it didn't go far enough uh, in terms of reform of the system, but it sort of opens up some real opportunity 
if we're creative, if we're willing to um, to rethink uh, some investment priorities to, to drive some of these um, these programs forward. As we think about sort of, I, I wish I had time to go into all the detail on each one of these programs, but from our perspective, these are some of the greatest hits, if you will, uh, of changes in the infrastructure bill that, that planners and local communities really need to, to, to know about. Um, one is just the fact that the overall sort of standard formula funding to MPOs for the planning activities required um, in the federal transportation program, those funds increased pretty significantly. Um, over the course of the five years of the reauthorization from baseline, they're up nearly 30%. Um, uh, there are a lot of planning set-asides embedded in many of the new programs, which we think is really uh, important. Um, we had argued for uh, additional funding, uh, well, beyond additional funding, but a whole new program aimed at resiliency and climate. So the fact that those are there, the PROTECT program has a planning set-aside so that there's an opportunity to get money directly for resiliency planning before you even move into the formula side to actually advance those plans and implement them. Um, there's sub-allocation for the climate program, which gives regions more of a direct uh, opportunity to, um, to drive where those, those funds go. Um, major new investment in safety. Um, if your community is at all focused on Vision Zero planning, safe streets, other kinds of pedestrian safety activities, major new support um, there, as well as some new planning uh, requirements some vulnerability assessments and then some targeting of those funds toward uh, areas that demand it based on on those assessments. There's a metro congestion program. This is a, a new program specifically for local governments to apply. So not the MPO, not the state, but local governments have access to these dollars. Um, on the broadband side, um, I wanted to emphasize the mapping component of this. So there's money for deployment of broadband, but there's also this focus on equity and broadband distribution and really understanding where there are gaps in coverage. And that's an area where I think the connection to planning is stronger. The connection to economic development strategies is really important. Um, electric vehicles, of course, are a huge part of both this bill and the reconciliation package. I would want to call some specific attention here to the Reconnecting Communities program. This is uh, a program aimed at remedying some of the inequities of the past. Um, think of freeways that may have uh, segregated um, communities, bisected neighborhoods. Um, there are a lot of places around the country who, as part of their equity strategies, are looking at um, uh, approaches to reconnect those places who've suffered those impacts. That program is in here. There's additional funding for it in the Build Back Better Act. And importantly, again, from our perspective, there's a set aside to actually do the planning and community engagement work before you start talking about uh, new capital projects. Um, I guess the last thing I would point out here on this list, I mentioned the, the accessibility and performance pilot programs, but I really want to underscore some of the changes to the TAP program. That's the major bike and pedestrian federal program. Um, significant increases in, in funding, more sub-allocation so that locals have more control over those dollars. Um, so, uh, and there's also some new equity targeting as, as part of that program and the safety program. So some significant advances, um, some I know feel kind of in the weeds if you're not a transportation person, but when you think about this in context with, with ARPA, you can really, I hope, see how some of the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle kind of come together. Let me close. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about Build Back Better and a program that we think is um, really critical as part of this. Even though it's a small part of the overall funding from a planning perspective, it's really critical. And it's called Unlocking Possibilities. It's a uh, 1.75 billion. This is based on the house number uh, that was approved uh, program aimed at zoning reform uh, and providing resources, not just to reward communities who do reform to build projects based on new codes. This program is, is different in that it doesn't rely on that sort of incentive. Rather, it supports activities to do the planning and to do the actual code reform. So plan implementation in this instance really is focused on how do we move forward um, with with actually rewriting our codes. So we think it's a it's a it's a major innovation. It's a real priority for the administration as well. Um, it has a 15% uh, admin cap, which again I think provides um, particularly good flexibility for how 
uh, communities would use it. This is one of those discretionary competitive programs though, uh, so it's not coming to you by formula if it's ultimately included, but would really um, you know, be something that would uh, need to be applied for, but could provide really important support for places that may um, you know, be ready to do reform, but lack the, the capacity and assistance to do it. Um, in, in terms of kind of the eligibilities and criteria, I'm not gonna go into this in any detail whatsoever, but you can see that it involves a lot of things from housing action plans, to code development, to reforming development processes, to linking to transportation investments and regional planning with criteria that are, are pretty, um, I think, straightforward and, and pretty broad. So a lot of opportunity here. This is a program that has flown really under the radar in a lot of the broad discussions about the bill, but an area that that could be could be very meaningful. And when you layer this on top of the other programs in ARPA and in the infrastructure bill, you know, our belief is that doing zoning reform, updating uh, the zoning maps and, and the underlying codes will boost the return on investment in other kinds of infrastructure projects and really bring these together. So it's it's an important part. There are other elements that are, are worth talking about that I don't have time for um, to go into detail that are in Build Back Better. Um, some specific funding for um, land trust, land banking, uh, community development activities, uh, a broader housing title that makes historic investments in affordability, and then some additional topping up of uh, transportation programs that were left on the cutting room floor in the discussion about the bipartisan package, again, related to transit and reconnecting communities, but some important climate provisions um, related there as well. So in terms of what next, like I said, we're waiting for the Senate to, to, to move on this. There are negotiations happening. Those negotiations are not largely centered on any of the housing and community development aspects of the bill. So we're sort of waiting to see how that top line number gets negotiated uh, out so that the whole package can ultimately move forward. Again, you know, the, the hope is to see that by the end of 2021. Um, uh, and and it, we're just waiting to see what happens over, over the next few weeks. So the last thing I'll say before I kick it to Keith, and sorry if I took a little bit more time here, but just a lot of ground to cover. But when we think about putting this all together, I think it is, again, really important to think about how do we really analyze what we want to do um, in a planning process, use some of the data tools that Keith's going to talk about to have a good analysis situation to, to stress test some of the ideas that are out there, and then to layer in these funds and really to look at how can we coordinate across agencies and across levels of government to ensure that these are complementary investments that advance a long-term vision. So it's a lot to do, it's a lot of work, um, but I think the opportunity moment it's really here um, where there's a lot of resources available for us to, to do some really innovative planning and to use this uh, as a chance to meet the moment um, and, and have these resources really flow into uh, transformational kinds of actions uh, in communities of all sorts. So uh, I'm gonna stop there. I will kick it over to, uh, to Keith to talk a little bit about some of the specific opportunities that he's seeing. So let's see, here we go. All right, can you hear me now? There we go. Just a little slow. So um, Jason, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, and actually uh, kudos for uh, using a schoolhouse rock image. Um, very nice. <laughs> Very nice. And and listen, Jason, in, in fairness, Jason uh, did a great job of covering this. He could have gone on for another hour and still not have gotten into the into all the detail um, on this. So there, there's a lot to go over. And again, we're we're going to hit this pretty high level, but we've we've gone into the weeds a, a little bit from time to time just to um, just to give you a better uh, grasp of, of what's going on. So. Um, let me go ahead and uh, get started. And so again, my name is Keith Cook. I'm the industry manager at Esri for planning and community development. And we're gonna talk about how we can use GIS to actually analyze and then prioritize and implement some of these initiatives uh, through the funding that's available. Uh, GIS is critical obviously because it helps us interconnect our communities. And this is particularly true uh, within planning departments. Planner, planning departments don't work in silos. They work with other 
department. They also work with neighboring cities and counties and state agencies as well. And GIS helps to create that understanding. We talk about um, understanding preceding action, and that's where GIS comes into play, is that it helps us create that understanding. And then GIS also provides a framework for how we conduct planning as well, right? So from if you think about it from every aspect of the planning process, from the time that the site plan or the um, the, the rezoning or any, you know, name the, the planning activity, when it comes into the office, we measure it, um, we manage the data, we can map it, we can visualize it, uh, we can model the data and analyze that model. And then of course we can get into the nuts and bolts of things and, and actually work on the on the design, which moves us into the decision making, where we inform stakeholders, gather feedback, and then again move into action. The good news is, is that planners have already been using GIS and they've been using it for years. And a lot of that has been has been because of the emergence of the web GIS pattern to where you no longer have to be a GIS expert to be able to use GIS tools. You no longer even have to have GIS software on your machine anymore to be able to do it. And so um, I'm just going to go quickly through some examples of this. Um, in Long Beach, California, they're using GIS to be able to uh, measure the suitability of affordable housing locations. And the reason why I really love this story is that it's not just, you know, where do we have vacant land or where, you know, where are the parcels large enough, but tying it to an economic mobility strategy, making sure that there is, you know, that, that the most suitable locations are proximity to transit and to jobs and to healthcare and education and, and recreation and so forth. So that it's a more comprehensive approach to affordable housing, because again, affordable housing doesn't work in a silo either. Uh, in Tacoma, Washington, they used crowd used GIS to help uh, crowdsource their housing policy, and so um, they uh, uh, reached out to the community to be able to provide input about the housing needs in specific neighborhoods. Once that came in and it was analyzed, the the city put out their um, their proposed housing policy so that people could see the current and the proposed situation or the the proposed um, uh, housing strategy to be able to see what that impact would be and how it could change theirs and the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, they're using this to, they're using GIS to be able to support what they call their equitable growth framework, where they're not having concentrations of specific specific areas for affordable housing, but rather spreading it out evenly uh, throughout neighborhoods. And then again, also focusing on a, a transit oriented design approach so that as the, the light rail expand, <laughs> expands in Charlotte, that they have um, uh, affordable housing that's close to transit locations, again, supporting an economic mobility strategy. And then in Seattle, Washington, I love this story. They, you know, in, in an effort to help deal with the um, ongoing housing shortage, um, they, there's been an aggressive uh, campaign to promote uh, accessory dwelling units, ADUs. And so the city is using GIS to create an ArcGIS hub site called AD Universe, which is really useful because it's basically a start to stop, um, a start to finish approach uh, so that the public is able to go in, see, you know, search their property, be able to see pre-approved uh, ADU designs that they can implement right away and start that process through a step-by-step -step guide. So again, without having to spend uh, hours sitting in the planning department, um, or on the phone and so forth, the property owners are able to move forward quickly. And again, by establishing ADUs, helping to alleviate uh, some of the housing shortage in the Seattle area. Um, as Jason mentioned, uh, you know, our, there are so many tasks that planners are dealing with and so much had to be, you know, for lack of a better word, tabled because of the pandemic. And so that may have been because of you know, we weren't in the office, um, there was a lack of resources, or there was a lack of funding. And I think, uh, just to reinforce Jason's point, if funding was your issue before, uh, it's not an issue anymore. Um, that's between the direct allocations and the, the numerous federal funding applications, as well as uh, what's coming down with the, the Build Back Better campaign. Uh, obviously, this is not an exhaustive list of the, the planning initiatives that can be undertaken by um, uh, 
by these these funding vehicles but this is something that i'm i'm sure just about every community on here can identify with at least one of these and be able to say yeah this is a project that we need to be able to to work on and there's money to be able to make that happen so to, to be able to do that one of the things we're going to have to be able to do is use gis to be able to prioritize projects and so very briefly the the important thing is and i want to emphasize this again is that um gis includes desktop that's absolutely true and your gis manager is more important than ever but you don't have to ha always have desktop to be able to use gis based tools and so this is and and where your data is located is no longer is no longer as important so this is called the geospatial infrastructure and so what it is is it's leveraging a digital twin of your city to be able to work with data as an individual as teams within departments within organizations or sharing between communities and to be able to do this across very focused uh, web-based applications and mobile-based applications in addition to desktop um, and it works at scale. So uh, the the uh, GIS, the, the geospatial infrastructure uh, that is set up in Auburn, Alabama, um, can be a, a similar infrastructure in Seattle, right? It's just, it works at, a, at different scales. And so the bottom line is that um, it no longer matters where you are or what software you have on your machine, it just matters who you are and what do you have access to and what do you what are what you should what should you be able to edit to analyze to publish and so forth and that's really what this geospatial infrastructure helps empower us to do and so for most people that means accessing the data through uh, very focused applications um, that allow frictionless access to this data to help you make the decisions that you need to do so when we talk about using GIS then specifically for this funding, what does that mean? Well, it takes us through a, we're gonna walk through a process here. The first thing is GIS helps us to understand neighborhood characteristics. Um, so in, in the ArcGIS platform, that's using the Business Analyst web app. So this gives us access to about 2000 uh, socioeconomic and demographic and business and job variables so that you can get a better understanding of your neighborhoods what they have what their deficiencies are do they have are they uh, experiencing food deserts do they have uh, the right workforce for the jobs that are in the area um, and being able to run analysis of things like service areas or doing demographic mapping the one you see on the bottom left is one i did that showed uh, that uh, combines median household income with a housing affordability index to be able to identify not just where is the affordable housing, but where is also the money to pay for it and understanding the flip side of that is where are the deficiencies there? Where does that need to be improved? And then from this, we can generate reports, infographics. Um, we can leverage our tapestry segmentation, which goes down to the block group level to provide socioeconomic and market level information about neighborhoods. Um, and then again, leveraging detailed business data as well. So the first thing, again, as I say this all the time, is that uh, understanding precedes action. And this is where we can help understand where our, our greatest needs are. The next step is to be able to derive business intelligence from our business systems. And so typically within a planning department, that's going to be the permitting system. That's going to be one of your, your mission critical business systems. So you may have, a, within a planning department, you may have a lot of people that use the permitting system, um, but you're also going to have some that don't because they don't access it on a daily basis. But that doesn't mean that there isn't information in that permitting system that would help them. So with tools like ArcGIS Insights, I can generate business intelligence from the permitting system where I don't necessarily have to see data on a granular level, but I can see it at a larger scale. So for instance, to be able to see all commercial permitting activity over the last 10 years and then sort it by county commission district or city council district um, be able to see uh, which permits have been are open which have been completed which have a stop work on them how has that trend changed over time um, so again being able to this is part of the understanding process but we're able to derive uh, business intelligence from from these systems then our next step would be to help use GIS to help generate 
policy development. And one of the phrases we use all the time here, and it's not just exclusive to Esri by any means, but making sure that you're taking a data-driven approach. So there's so much content, there's so much data, authoritative data, that's out there today to help drive decisions for, uh, for housing, for economic development, for updating comprehensive plans and so forth. A lot of this is available through the Esri Living Atlas, a lot you certainly have within your own organizations. Um, and there's a free resource at Esri, esri.com slash policy maps. That's the Esri Maps for Public Policy, where a lot of this data is already pre-configured, so you can jump in, um, do, do assessments, again, so that your policies are not anecdotal. It's not a good idea because Keith says it's a good idea, it's a good idea because it addresses the, um, the the strain on on affordable housing that we have in these particular neighborhoods, right? So it becomes harder to uh, refute a policy when it's more data driven as opposed to anecdotal. Third, you know, next to last year is is how GIS will support civic inclusion, and this is critical because how a public how the public interacts with their government. As, and specifically with planning, has changed. If you try to tell people today that the only way that they're going to be able to interact with you is to show up to the planning commission meeting at Tuesday at seven, uh, you're not going to have you're not going to have real representation of everyone that cares about um, that cares about the uh, initiative that's that's up for question. So taking a modern approach, like with ArcGIS Hub, allows uh, a more modern approach so that people can provide feedback can get authoritative information from the planning department or other departments and be able to provide feedback and, and create a two-way dialogue. So I mentioned what Seattle is doing um, with AD Universe, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, providing neighborhood snapshots, uh, you know, demographics, uh, housing information for each of the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and Bucks County, Pennsylvania showing um, the activity that's going on in the upcoming planning commission meeting, but also what's happened over the last four years. So people can see, get a, a quick history lesson about what's gone on within the county. And then finally, we get down to the granular level. So once we've done all this, we can use GIS to actually do some scenario planning and actual design work. So what will the affordable housing look like? What will the mixed use development or the new walkable community that we're going to create look like? What will this new incubator um, uh, what will the service area look like and how will that actually um, change the, will that alter the characteristics of the neighborhood at all? This is done through ArcGIS Urban. And so again, it's a web-based application that allows planners to be able to come up with multiple designs based on the zoning characteristics and zoning parameters um, and create new proposed zones. So as we move, you know, the, the um, unlocking possibilities is really exciting for me that portion of the build back better is because that's actually almost what urban is created for is to play out these different scenarios about what um, what we can do to update and change zoning to meet the modern needs of our community so it's no secret then that gis is transforming planning and I'm certainly not going to go through all of these points here but it's it's much more than it was when uh, when i was doing this uh, maybe 20 years ago when the planner would stand over my shoulder and point to the screen and say, change that to low density residential, change that to this. No, there's more to it than that. And planners and economic developers and housing directors are all able to use GIS now uh, without having to be GIS experts. So just before we wrap up, I wanted to make sure you were aware of this, um, that we do have a specific site that you can go to. Um, it's go.esri.com slash stimulus funding. And this is our um, hub page for aligning with federal stimulus programs. So it's going to be a great resource that you're going to want to bookmark and go back to to give you, again, examples of how other cities and counties, states and regional uh, organizations are leveraging stimulus funds um, and GIS to be able to enact the policies and the initiatives that their community needs. So I know we've covered a, a great deal here and there's um, I sure many of you will have questions. Um, again, feel free to add them. We've got a few minutes uh, to be able to take questions, but if you'd like to reach out, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, you can visit our planning site at esri.com slash planning or reach out on, on Twitter or LinkedIn. So with that, Natalie, I will um, 
I will pass it back to you and see if we had uh, any questions to cover. Yes, um, so the first question um, is for Jason. Um, and I guess we could combine these two. So which government departments and agencies are likely to implement and administer the majority of their grant funding? And additionally, can regional planning commissions receive funds? It's a great question. Uh, and and the, the answer isn't entirely straightforward, unfortunately. Um, you, you saw that um, a, a lot of these programs have some specific applications. So in, in, in the cases of things like ARPA funding for public transportation, those are aimed directly at the public transit authorities. Um, for the local government funding, it, it obviously it could be much broader than that, right? It's less agency specific. I think what the implications of that are is that um, it's going to put uh, – it could be called a burden, it could be called an opportunity on, on local governments to coordinate across agencies to make some of these decisions and to understand how different agencies are investing the dollars. You will see that a lot of the money flows into either transportation or housing agencies, but I do think, uh, and this is not just me being parochial about it, I do think the planning department has a real opportunity to be the hub, to, to, to coordinate a lot of these and to use some of the tools that Keith was just talking about to help share a vision so that um, even if the, the the applicant is a different agency they understand the piece that they're playing uh, in, in in the larger context in terms of the regional question um, it's yes and no right so some of the programs do have a very explicit regional focus when you look at the infrastructure bill for instance a lot of those funding uh, streams are, are targeted at metropolitan planning organizations and other regional bodies. Uh, in terms of planning commission specifically, that's where you would need to look at programs like those EDA categories that I was talking about for some of the, the, the regional strategy, the regional planning elements um, related to this. Um, uh, that said, when you look at things like unlocking possibilities uh, and some of the other categories, they're kind of agnostic uh, in terms of which agency. So it is entirely possible, particularly if if HUD or another agency chooses to make regional coordination uh, a criteria or a, a ranking criteria of some sort, then there is really an opportunity for for regional bodies to to access those dollars and and, and to to be the you know the the lead agency, if you will. This next question is for Keith. Um, so if a city already has an enterprise agreement with Esri, how do they know if um, they have all the necessary software in order to um, perform the tasks that you just shared with us? Yes, so I, everything that we showed, if you have a, um, a, if you have a negotiated enterprise agreement, the answer is almost certainly yes. Uh, if you have a small government enterprise agreement or a small departmental enterprise agreement, the answer is yes with an asterisk. The only thing that is not included as part of that is ArcGIS Urban, which is what does the scenario planning. But because you have an enterprise agreement, you actually do get that at 50% off. So that would only be 1500 But everything else is included. So insights, business analyst, web app, uh, the ArcGIS solutions, uh, policy mapping, hub that's all that's all included okay right. well thank you keith and jason for sharing your expertise today um a couple reminders that this webinar um, has been recorded and we will be following up with an email in the next coming week so that you can access the recording um, we will also be posting the recording on apa's website for aicp um, uh, credits um, so be on the lookout for that as well um, thank you all for joining us um, and we hope to see you next time